Uh, hello, everyone. It's Dr. Bill. Uh, it's three o'clock now on Wednesday. Uh, I somehow don't know why the video is on now, so it is working. I give up. Anyway, I'm going to do chapter six. Um, it's kind of just a general beginning on um, the skeleton. We'll get into bones uh, and then muscles. And remember last week, I, you know, I said, uh, jokingly, I said, have any of you had children? And a few of you raised your hands. <clears throat> and I said, well, did you give birth to, you know, a grown person? Number one, no. And number two, did they have a full skeleton? No. We want some of that to be <clears throat> uh, chondral beginnings or card. Remember I said uh, chondral always relates to cartilage sometimes and costal always generally relates to ribs, but please realize, you know, we'll get into the fontanelle and some of these other um, cartilage areas uh, in the body and, and realize that, you know, when an infant is born, um, uh, we want that to be pliable and then it's going to ossify, <clears throat> all right? Or if someone is born prematurely, sometimes um, some of the, low, the lower lumbar um, vertebrae don't, um, ossify completely. Sometimes they can have some cartilaginous um, remnants, uh, usually a spinous process, and then we'll, you know, we're, we have time, we're going to spina bifida occulta and spina, dif spina bifida <clears throat> in general. And sometimes people are just left with a uh, cartilaginous uh, spinous process or an osseous, not a huge deal. <clears throat> You know, if it's left open, a um, meningeous seal or something like that, that can be very, very deadly. That has to be operated on. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I'll get into this. Um, I have some uh, <clears throat> bone models next to me, and I actually have some real bones, which are absolutely, literally impossible to get um, legally, apparently. So. Um, I have them here. Um, if you're one of my students, I will let you look at them and you can pick them up. But I'm really, um, pick them, I'm really protective of them. So treat, or, um, treat them precariously, all right? So as I said, the human skeleton initially consists of just cartilage, which is replaced by bone, except in areas requiring flexibility. And we talked last week about, <clears throat> um, you know, parts of the esophagus, the bronchioles, um, the ears, part of the, the um, <clears throat> septum of the nose, superficial to the vulvar and things like that. We talked a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, if you're doing this online, if you're not in my class, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Is this too far down? Good thing. I completely give up. <clears throat> this should be advancing, right? <clears throat> so if I screw this up, um, I apologize. So basic structures, types, and locations. So we'll talk about basic structure of bones. And, you know, I left you guys that coloring worksheet if you want. We'll talk about types of bones, whether it's compact bone, spongy bone, long bone, short bone, um, and the locations where you primarily find it, um, you know, and the different types and, and what their purpose might be. So skeletal cartilage is made of highly resistant molded cartilage tissues that consist primarily of water. And remember, <clears throat> I said last week that cartilage is not, it's a vascular linking area. It doesn't contain blood vessels or nerves. And I said the caveat to that is it takes um, forever or a very, very long time for any of that to heal. Or, I said before, the only way this cartilage can get nutrition is through motion, we have to <clears throat> compress it like a, a sponge and it has to pull in those nutrients from the synovial membrane of that joint. Remember I said peri always means around, perichondrium, around, peri, chondrium meaning cartilage, chondro. Layer of dense connective tissue surrounding cartilage like a girdle, right? It helps cartilage resist outward expansion. So. You know, last week I said <clears throat> you may, you know, I talked about the intercalated or the inner um, vertebral discs, the pulse nucleus in there, 
and <clears throat> some um, meniscus in your knee, then I said a lot of times they'll tell you that it's there for shock absorption, which is sort of true. But I said, remember, it's really there to help um, tracking of the, the fibula and the tibia, right? So they don't track or shift, right? So you don't, um, <clears throat> you know, tear out a lateral collateral ligament or medial um, collateral ligament, cruciate ligament or things like that. So um, <clears throat> helps cartilage resist outward expansion. So if you were to, you know, let's just say you were to jump off a roof, you know, and you planted uh, your feet and you compress the, the tib, um, tibia and femur, Together, we wouldn't want that cartilage to blow outward. We want that a girdle around it, sort of like a <clears throat> girdle. Or if you're not sure what that is, some of the younger generation, it's a very, very thick, like a Spanx. This is full thing. It contains blood vessels and nutrient delivery to the cartilage. So realize that the pericardium around that lining around it gets blood supply, so it has nutrients, and we'll find out that that synovial. Um, joint <clears throat> has a synovial layer and it'll produce some a synovial fluid and that will um, generally provide nutrients for the cartilage and we don't want that synovial fluid to get infected, the synovium that could be extremely painful. And with any, like we talked about the um, pericardial effusion with the heart, things like that, we don't want the fluid to be Overproduced, we don't want inflammation, we don't want it to be underproduced. We talked about that friction rub of the glove. So, cartilage is made up of chondrocytes. Remember, chondrocartilage site meaning adult, grown, grown ass cells, whatever you want to think about it. Cells encased in small cap, uh, cavities like lacuna. And we saw that, we'll see that in bone. We sort of, um, you know, we saw it with the cartilage and we saw it in those. The slides, the histology slides in the lab within the jelly like extracellular matrix. Right. And I talked about the extracellular matrix before and um, with tissues, and we'll go over it again, over and over again. So, like I'm using these words, but I want you to start breaking it down extracellular. So, that outside of the cell, whether it's a chondrocyte, osteocyte, um, could be a, a cell anywhere in your body. There's extracellular um, fluid, there's extracellular matrix. Remember, a matrix is that empty sort of space, not empty, but it's a <clears throat> has a, either fluid or a gel like um, area around it. It wouldn't obviously be empty. It doesn't have a lot of solid, rock solid things in it. So there's an there's, um, area for movement. So whether you're a dendritic cell or, or something, you want to take something from that a component of that and bring it to your immune system you can do that <clears throat> so there's three types of cartilage we talked a little bit about hyaline or i know i talked about hyaline cartilage provides support flexibility resistance right and i said this is going to be this is going to be very very glassy and it's going to be on all the um articular surfaces and articular um, means where they they come together so at the end of these bones, and I asked you guys in class, you know, why would we want it smooth? And they said, <clears throat> to prevent friction. That's the absolute the right answer. And I was talking about biomechanical, if you have bad posture, flat feet, if things don't track right, they can start rubbing. Um, and when you rub through that hyaline cartilage, you can get bone on bone, and that can cause a lot of osteoarthritis. And I really don't, you know, don't want you to go or tell your patients um, you know, they say they have left or right hip pain. They can say, well, it's just old age. And then you can pretty much say, well, so you're telling me that my left hip is older than my right hip. So it can be uh, induced by old age or it can be more prevalent with old age, but it isn't caused by old age. If it's, <clears throat> if it's unilateral, it would be caused by a tracking problem or a, um, a postural uh, in, uh, inequality, we use that word. So this provides support, flexibility, and resilience. Most abundant type contains collagen fibers only. And we said before, collagen is usually, when you think of collagen, think of strength and durability. Okay, so this is articular joints, costal meaning ribs, and I 
pulls out that skeleton and I showed you the costal cartilage that um, <clears throat> articulates with the, the ribs and then the sternum in some, some parts, right? Respiratory, the larynx, voice box, <clears throat> nasal cartilage, and nose tip. All right, and, and you could, you could theoretically, you could say the soft, the hyaline cartilage, um, <clears throat> depending on where you read. Um, could be in the, the bronchi or the esophagus, <clears throat> but for here, we'll just go with this. So elastic cartilage, when you see elastic, you would say it's supposed to be a little bit more flexible, right? Similar to hyaline cartilage, but it contains elastin fiber. So it has <clears throat> um, collagen, but it also has elastic fibers. And we said before, the elastic fibers were thinner. They allow for some kind of flexibility. We will not to be real flexible or flimsy, but it allows a little bit of motion. So if you're thinking, if you're, you know, your external ear, if somebody were to grab it or you bump into something, or, you know, even if you went to, you know, lay down and go to bed, you would want it to be a little bit uh, more flexible. If someone were to do a wrestling or in a fight with someone and they grabbed your ear, you'd want it to be flexible so they wouldn't have something solid to hold on to. And I asked you guys before, you know, what was your extra, um, exterior auditory meatus or what was the ear for? And then we talked about, you know, I said, Parabolic tissue is going <clears> to <throat> amplify or, or not amplify, it's going to catch sound waves and direct them towards the inner ear and the epiglottis. All right. So, what that's that flap that, that is supposed to flip down when you swallow so you don't aspirate things into your lungs. When we look at the mid sagittal section of the skull and the, and the uh, esophagus, you know, we'll look at that conduit and we'll see. Um, that epiglottis, all right? <clears throat> I think last year I did order a model of that. It's got like a, it'll show the epiglottis moving up and down. I can't find it. Someone has a movie on it. And then <clears throat> fibril cartilage. I pointed this out last week when we were talking about the medial, um, the meniscus of the knee. And I said the vertebral, sorry, the vertebral discs, all right? They're really there for, uh, a little bit of flexibility, and they're really there for um, shock absorption, right? All right, thick collagen fibers has great tensile strength. And I talked about their arrangement, <clears throat> their very, very specific arrangement of those layers of fibers. And I said that uh, Dunlop, I think Dunlop was a good, was Dunlop a good, I want to say Dunlop, but I'm wrong. Um, they actually looked at that um, angle. Um, orientation and they uh, replicated that with the bias and tires. Mm. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> God, it's... All right. Um, so the bones of the cartilage of the human skeleton. And I don't know if I can blow this up for you guys. But... So there's cartilage in the external ear, cartilage in the nose. You have a deviated septum. They go in. They can burrow that out. Stick uh, plastic and apparatus in there to reshape it. Um, <clears throat> extremely painful. Articular cartilage joints. So remember, articulation or articular cartilage is where two bones articulate or come together. In vertebral discs, we spoke about that in class. If you're in lecture with me, pubic symphysis, right there. We want a little bit of motion, and if you're a female. Third trimester, we want the oxytocin. Um, the oxytocin is released and it really loosens up all those joints. And it's in preparation for the pelvic girdle to start expand, um, getting ready for uh, labor. There's your meniscus, those are your pad like cartilage and the knee joint. And once again, that's really, if you look, it's really there to help track those bones so they don't um, pivot. <clears throat> You know, you'll see, um, or you'll have a patient come in, you know, they might be super young and they're going to say, well, how in the world did you blow out your knee? Well, they were either slalom skiing or something where you're going to plant and turn. Hockey, football, you plant and then you pivot and then those bones, they, um, they don't track. Because the knee really isn't 
supposed to rotate. It's supposed to just do flexion or flexion do extension. But if you plant and then your upper torso turns, then you can you can untrack that and you're going to tear the ligaments on either side, the lower lateral. <clears throat> <My eyes. clears throat> All right, growth of cartilage. So we're going to have appositional growth or interstitial growth. So apposition is around the circumference, appositional growth. Um, we'll talk about this with cartilage. And then after your epiphyseal plate seal, um, as an adult, women, you know, 18, 19, 20, men, 19, 20, 21 through 25, when those epiphyseal plates, um, seal or they stop growing and we'll see it has a uh, and cartilage is beginning with that too um the bone can't grow in length it can it can grow in circumference and you'll see that with weight bearing activity or with someone um they're doing a, a, a any kind of a laborious thing with a lot of weight all right the bones can't always grow up but they can grow uh bigger and circumference if you need more strength, right? <clears throat> Not strength as in more muscle strength, but more um, tensile strength to um, for bone attack or for muscle attachment. And we'll talk about the Sharpie's fibers and how those muscles <clears throat> um, and tendons attach and they're woven into that Sharpie's fiber and the uh, periosteum around the bone. <clears throat> so cartilage forming cells in the pericardium peri around secrete matrix against the external face of the existing cartilage. So we'll see how that is going to excrete um, stuff into the matrix is going to cause that cartilage or the bone to expand appositionally. New matrix laid down on the surface of the cartilage and then um, cartilage is like I said is generally a precursor to bone and this, you know, here we're really talking about infancy or um, early development. Interstitial, where I said, we were talking about interstitial fluid um, between the capillary beds and all the cells in your body. So interstitial um, <clears throat> is the fluid in between cells, more or less. It can also be called the uh, extracellular matrix, depending on what, um, what they're referring to. All right, so um, when you're studying this or reading about it, uh, it can get a little bit confusing. All right, so I, I totally get it. So if I, in lecture, if I say something, you're not quite sure, just raise your hand um, and I'll explain to you because we're gonna be learning different words um, that can mean the same thing, depending on who you're speaking to or where they went to school, or you know, you, if you're in the medical field, what their specialty is, because if their specialty is neurology or um, epidemiology or whatever, their terminology might be slightly different. So chondrocytes within the lacuna, remember that lacuna is that area where they kind of live in, divide and secrete new matrix, expanding cartilage from within. So the chondrocytes are those adult cells, and we said the chondroblasts were there to monitor things. Remember, I said the, the kind of blasts were like the 20, 30 year olds who were really the workforce um, of the area. But the chondrocytes are the managers of the supervisional uh, cells that kind of, uh, their job is to really kind of keep track of things. And if things go awry or something happens, remember, I said those chondrocytes <clears throat> can revert back to chondroblast if need be. So, new matrix is made within the cartilage. Calcification, all right, so that's exactly what it means. Cartilage starts to calcify, <clears throat> occurs during normal bone growth in youth, but can also occur in old age, all right? So it is not unusual for uh, patients, and this can start as early, I've seen it as early as uh, 50, 55, where like uh, the external part of the ear will get, it'll be um, really, really rigid. It doesn't have to be the whole thing, but things can start to uh, calcify or get more bone-like. Hardened cartilage is not the same as bone. Very similar when you palpate it, but it's not the same. 
So the function is bonus. So if we ask you on a multiple choice question, or if you, you get a, a question on an exam, <clears throat> it'd be like probably something, um, what is not a function of a bone? All right. So support for body and soft organs. So you think of bone as a lever arm or a skeleton or your armor or whatever you want to think of it. So the number one, most when we talk about a skeleton or bones, people automatically generally always say support. Protection protects the brain, spinal cord, and vital organs. Remember that the posterior um, portion or your central nervous system is encased in that osseous um, skull and your spinal cord. It's really there to protect your central nervous system because we mentioned before, central nervous system for all intents and purposes does not uh, undergo mitotic division. Only those astrocytes um, or those glial cells, any of the supporting cells can do that. So remember with any kind of a brain cancer, as horrific as that is, it's not really your neurons. It's going to be <clears throat> um, astrocytes um, or any of those glial cells. Those are the ones that can perform um, mitosis, so they would be the cells of a brain cancer. Taking your vital organs, you know, your liver, your spleen, um, it's not really your lower. Um, your heart, obviously your lungs. So anything that's, uh, some areas in your pelvis are sort of protected. <clears throat> Triglyceride fat storage, fat used uh, for energy source is stored in bone cavities. This is generally, <clears throat> excuse me, brown fat. All right, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's brown fat. All right, osteocalcin, all right. Secreted by bones helps regulate insulin secretion, glucose levels, and metabolism. Right. And we'll be talking later about calcitonin. Um, I mentioned oxytocin before. <clears throat> That's really a hormone. Uh, you know, all right, so there's 206 bones in the human um, skeleton divided into two groups based on location. So axial, when we're looking at the skeleton, I said the axis, the X or the X plane. So axial would be <clears throat> long axis of the body. So your skull, particular column, rib cage. All right. I saw one book that uh, included the, the pelvis, which um, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue with the author, but that's not how I learned it either. So it would be. Uh, skull, vertebral column, and your rib cage. Appendicular or appendix, your appendices. All right, bones of the upper and lower limbs. So girdles attaching limbs to axial skeleton. So that could be your your scapula, your humerus, um, ulna, radius, um, femur, tibia, fibula, um, ribs, things like that. So the bones and cartilage of the human um, skeleton. So remember I said that the epiglottis is there to, to flip down, it's cartilaginous so that you don't aspirate food. You have the larynx, um, voice box, and then your trachea, the air conduit. And remember we said we want these to be cartilaginous and elastic so they have a little bit of recoil. And that'll come into play when we're talking about um, asthma, some of these respiratory issues. All right, <clears throat> there's your costal cartilage. And I said costal always, generally always refers to ribs, all right, and your articular cartilage, pubic symphysis, right? um, <clears throat> cartilage of the, um, the femur and the acetabulum. All right? And if that doesn't track right, people have to have hip replacements and some people, this when they're born, this um, the acetabulum, that depression there is too shallow. The femur doesn't really track right. Bones are, are classified according to one of four shapes. So we have long bones. <clears throat> they're longer than they are wide, and these would be your limb bones, and I think. That. 
As we know, this is a <clears throat> tibia. Black tibia. It's here. This is a humerus. This is scapula. Those would be long bones. Longer than they are wide. Short bones are cube shaped bones of the wrist or elbow. I just bought a couple. So these are cube shaped bones. This happens to be phallus for foot. And sesamoid bones form within tendons. All right. So sesamoid bones, you have uh, your pisiform here is a sesamoid bone. And then your patella, we used to call it your kneecap, literally attaches, it goes over the knee and attaches part of your quadricep to your um, sorry, blank, um, tibia, all right? So it, it, it goes across that joint, it's a sesamoid bone. They vary in size and number in different individuals. Now, flat bones are exactly what they, they say. They're thin, flat, slightly curved. So sternum, scapula, we used to call that your shoulder blade until today. Ribs and most of the skull bones. All right, so I'm going to see if I can. This motion light. Um, Swear, sternum, sternum, this is scapula. I happen to know that this <clears throat> is a right scapula because this would be gliding over your ribs over here, bicep attachment. <clears throat> The rib, and this is the part that attaches to your spine in the back, wraps around the front, anterior here. All right. And when you guys are learning these, the thin portion here is always pointing down, inferior. All right. This is your clavicle, you just call it your breastbone, maybe. <clears throat> Most of your skull bones, we're going to start learning this in a lab. All right. <clears throat> so, irregular bones are going to be your vertebrae. And we'll learn <clears throat> very specific um, atlas, axis, um, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. There are differences in how you can tell one from the other. All right. And your hip bone. This is called the innominant. It's actually three different bones. Uh, in infancy, they are three different and they fuse together, right? <clears throat> Similar to the sutures in the skull, if you can see that, right? They're literally separated, they can fuse. And then if you know, <clears throat> you've seen a baby, they have botanel, which is cartilage that hasn't ossified yet. <clears throat> so there are just some classifications of bones, right? And there, it's in your book. So if you're just in lecture, um, I'm assuming you had lab, or maybe you took uh, lab and didn't do great in lecture. You're retaking lecture, or maybe you um, are super smart and you want to take lecture first and then lab later, or break it up a little bit. You can do that. I always recommend that you do lecture and lab together usually concurrently, like one after the other. And if you can get the same instructor for lecture and lab, you can, obviously you can't, but you know, you do what you can. So bone structure, we'll go over that. We're gonna look at these slides a bit, look up the osteon, um, 
Bowman's canals, lacunae, um, central canal, periosteum. We'll look at some of these things. And I'll try to explain it in lecture, uh, and I'll definitely go around and lab to help you guys out. So bones are organs. <clears throat> so organs are made out of three different tissues, and they have a very specific function. Bone, as I told everyone in lecture, is not you know, what the Flintstones uh, use and the, the, the cartoons, all right? So they're very, very metabolically active. They have a huge amount of blood supply. And we talked about that in lecture. I said, if you've ever seen a bone, a compound fracture where a bone literally breaks through the skin, <clears throat> it can bleed a lot, right? So bones are organs because they contain different types of tissue, bones or anything osseous, Whenever you see osseous now, interosseous membrane or ossification, osteocyte, osteoblast, that refers to bone. So that's the tissue that predominates or is a majority. Right? <clears throat> but a bone also has nerve, nervous tissue. Remember, I said that that is around the periosteum. All right, remember, I said if you have a hairline fracture that might not show up on an x-ray from a whiplash or a, a very tiny fracture. You have to wait for that callus formation a day or two later. And I said, if you're unsure, you grab the tuning fork, you make it vibrate, you touch that to the bone. If um, <clears throat> there's a fracture and it irritates the periosteum, I said, your patient's gonna jump off the table or the bench if you do it right. <clears throat> Cartilage. All right, and we'll see that cartilage um, in the articulations, and we'll see it um, uh, during the embryonic stages and, and during formation. Fibrous connective tissue, uh, muscle cells, and epithelial cells in, the, uh, in its blood vessels. So the three levels of structure. Growth is stuff we can see with the naked eye, you know, stuff that we're mostly familiar with. Microscopic. We'll see that on the slides, and we're looking at the cross section of that. Generally, there's always a question on that in exam, and usually there's always a question on bone. In a lab practical, so you can generally um, count on that, and it's really easy. You can't mistake bone. In chemical, we'll talk about hydroxyapatite um, <clears throat> crystals and um, calcitonin. Then we'll talk about some of the hormone or calcium regulation and how bones break down and rebuild and um, the sacrificial bonds that they have so that your bone is a little bit flexible. Uh, if you were in lecture last week, you remember me talking about, you know, if you jump off the curb or whatever you want, your bone to have a little bit of flexibility. And I talked to you about Wolf's Law and how your bones continuously break down and rebuild every, theoretically, every seven years. And I said, if I x-rayed or <clears throat> did a radiograph on all of you right now, in seven years when you come back as uh, <clears throat> RNs, MPs, you know, uh, physical therapists or whatever it is you're going into, and I re um, x-ray you, none of those um, osteoclasts will be the same ones. So compact and spongy bone, Compact is usually um, on the external, uh, deep to the um, per periosteum, but superficial to the spongy bone of the trabecular um, network, but, but we'll do a cross section that I'll show you. Dense outer layer on every bone that appears smooth and solid, and that is what the peri around osteum is gonna attach to. And then we talked about muscle tendons and how the tendon uh, is um, attached to the periosteum like a weave, okay? It's interwoven in there. So if you evolve some muscle, if you overlift or you're um, <clears throat> lifting something you turn or um, you know, you're lifting something you don't pay attention to or you think that something, you think something's lighter than it is and you go to lift it, and evolves a muscle, you literally rip that tendon out of the periosteum. It can be very, very painful. And as long as you have a full evolution, it can reheal, but a full evolution needs a surgical repair. So spongy bone um, looks like sponge candy if you bite into that. 
made up of a honeycomb of small needle-like or flat pieces of bone called tubercula. Open spaces between the tubercula are filled with red or <clears throat> yellow bone marrow. All right, and we'll talk a little bit about the bone marrow, what it does, and you know how it's um, crucial for all of your uh, blood cell formation. So there's compact and spongy bone. There's spongy bone. We'll talk later about the epiphyseal plate here, um, the growth plate. There's compact bone. You see it's very, very dense. So if I can get this up super close a little bit. This, folks, is actually a real. All right, so this. Femur, right? It happens to be a left femur. All right, so you can see the spongy trabecula here. And then if you look at the cortex, the medulla, cortex, remember I said from the other lecture. So if there's a cortex, there's always a medulla, medullary bone, cortex. So adrenal cortex, brain, kidney, bone, um, cortical, and or medullary or medulla and cortex. Cortex is always outside, medulla is always the inside. Okay. There's no exceptions that, that I'm aware of, but I you know, don't know a whole lot. But structure of short, irregular, and flat bones consists of thin plates of spongy bone, diplo, or right, not like serious radio 52 with the DJ, covered by compact bone. Compact bone sandwich between connective tissue membranes. So you'll see it'll be in between two um, tissue membranes, and we'll talk about uh, I think we'll interosseous membrane, and we'll talk about some things like that. So periosteum, I've mentioned before, covers the outside of compact bone, so it'll be on the outside of the compact bone, and the endosteum covers the inside. So remember, I said endo always is aligning your inside. Endo, osteum, osseous always means bone. So you can figure that out. Inside of the bone, osteum covers inside portion of the compact bone. <clears throat> bone marrow is scattered throughout the spongy bone. There's no defined marrow cavity. So inside of here, it's just scattered all over, and it doesn't have cells or complete compartments. Right? It's scattered throughout the spongy bone. There's no defined um, marrow activity, but marrow is very, very active. Uh, red and yellow marrow. Hyaline cartilage covers area of a bone that is part of a mobile joint. So anyone we look at joints, anything, there's, let's see that. <clears throat> so, Sorry, I didn't bring it. <clears throat> but you know, your patella would be here, femur, and then between here, here, here would be your hyaline cartilage. It's really the nice So <clears throat> Between. And we'll talk about form bolus function. So your shoulder and your hip joints are similar, but I'm sure we'll all agree that your shoulder generally has a lot more flexibility. The uh, <clears throat> depression in there is much more shallow as opposed to the acetabulum or as coccyx, which is very, very deep. So hip is much more stable and sturdy, but less rotation. So there, <clears throat> here's your skull, all right. all right? So once again, there's cortical bone there, spongy bone in here, and that's a blow up in there. Right? <clears throat> 
<clears throat> right. structure of short or regular or flat bottom. So these could be, um, you know, your digits can be um, cuboid, navicular. Um, any of the flat bones, and, um, ribs, things like that. This is the thin plates of spongy bone. Oh, good. All right, <clears throat> so structure of a typical long bone. So, if you look at a long bone, they're gonna give you classic, Diaphysis, epi, epi means on. And you'll learn about um, the epiphyseal plate, the growth plate, which seals off after adolescence and early adulthood. So long bones have a shaft, the diaphysis. Bone extends the epiphysis. Epi means on. So it's usually going to attach to something. <clears throat> In membranes, diaphysis. The shaft, the tube of the shaft that forms a long axis, consists of, consists of compact bone. See that? Surrounded the central medullary cavity in here. Remember, this is where the bone marrow is going to be made. <clears throat> this filled with yellow marrow in adults. Epiphysis or epiphysis <clears throat> ends of long bones that. Uh, consists of compact bone externally and spongy bone internally. So <clears throat> this could be an epiphysis. Ends of long bone that consists of compact bone. If you look and get as close as I can, very, very compact. <clears throat> Particular cartilage, which is going to articulate with something into the cartilage for that friction to reduce it. <clears throat> All right, between the diaphysis between the diaphysis, remember that's the shaft, and the epiphysis is the epiphyseal line, and this is where remnant of child epiphyseal plate where bone growth occurs. Remember, once those, there's your epiphyseal plate right there. <clears throat> All right, this. Is a humerus, and there's your epiphyseal plate, there's your articular cartilage. All right, and this says proximal epiphysis. Remember, proximal, proximal as opposed to distal, <coughs> much closer to the midline. Remember, this is an anatomical position. Sorry. Lord, going on? <clears throat> so there's a cross section. Transverse cross section showing you there's a medullary cavity. All right, there's some yellow marrow. This is where a lot of your blood formation is going to take place. There's a cross section. <clears throat> there's that articular cartilage, depending on where we are. There's your compact bone. There's the osteon here we're going to see, the functional unit of all bone. There's your central canal where blood vessels are going to come through. There's lacunae here, and these things are all going to be able to communicate with each other, right? So membranes, there's two types. The peri means around, endo. Remember, endo is lining. Peri is around, external. Endo is inside. The periosteum is a white double-layered membrane that covers external surfaces except for joints. This is where your pain-sensitive fibers are. And this is where those Sharpie's fibers are, which are going to attach the tendons from the muscles. All right, so we have that attachment so that when you contract your muscles volitionally, your voluntary muscles, the insertion always goes towards the origin. Origin is generally always the most proximal. All right, so with muscle contraction or any kind of a joint, when the muscle contracts, the insertion point always moves towards the origin. That's, I think there's one exception, but does it, for this course, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> All 
right, so fibrous layer, outer layer consisting of dense or regular connective tissue consisting of Sharpie's fibers that secure to the bone matrix, all right? Osteogenic, all right, so osteo means bone, genic. So we're thinking osteogenic, well, what does that mean? That's probably gonna pre be producing something that has to do with bone. <clears throat> Inner lining, abutting bone, it contains primitive osteogenic stem cells that can give rise to most all bone cells. All right, so if these are stimulated or irritated or um, <clears throat> turned on for some reason, it's going to start laying down more bone. Now, if you're older than 21 or 22 or 25, remember, we can't grow up or down because the epiphyseal plate's sealed, but we can grow appositionally around. So if you have something that's constantly irritated, you're constantly breaking down bone from heavy, heavy labor, body will start turning these on, they'll start growing bone circumferentially around it. Contains many nerve fibers and blood vessels that continue on to the shaft of the nutrient foramen. And I showed you that a couple pictures ago, <clears throat> that central canal. All right, and like I said before, if you've ever broken a bone, um, you know, God forbid, football injury, hockey injury, car accident, a fall, anything, it's extremely painful. Right. And if you have a fracture and it doesn't show up on an x-ray, once again, I said, wait two days, insist on another image, that callus formation will show up in the reparative stage. And when in doubt, get out a tuning fork. Anchoring points for tendons and ligaments. And remember, tendons, muscle to bone, ligaments, bone to bone. And once these things are stretched, they generally don't ever, um, come back. All right. So think about that. If you have a rubber band or, you know, a last, say you have your, your favorite pair of um, underwear or whatever, or, stret or uh, sweatpants that haven't lasted, you know, and, and you gained a lot of weight and you really, really stretch them out, they never come back to the way they used to be. All right, <clears throat> endosteum, remember that's endo means inner lining, delicate connective tissue membrane covering internal bone surfaces, covers the trabeculae of spongy bone. Remember that trabeculae was that sponge candy looking buttressing. Right, and if you look at this, it actually has the same design as if you've seen any of the cathedrals in Rome, they have this what's called buttressing. They actually went in <clears throat> and did similar structure to support these huge um, cathedrals that are hundreds and hundreds of feet high, all these open spaces, they actually copied that buttressing for that, uh, that design. <clears throat> all right. So, um, you know, nature has pretty good ideas. So we want to copy that whenever possible. Covers trabeculae of sponge bone, lines, canals that pass through compact bone. Like the periosteum contains osteogenic cells that can differentiate into other bone cells. So if we stimulate that area for any reason, it can differentiate into more bone cells. Or let's say we have uh, <clears throat> some kind of um, blood abnormality, okay? We produce more blood cells or thrombocytopenia, or if we have anemia, or something, or let's say we have some kind of, um, you know, we have something toxic that starts killing off our, our medullary cavity or killing off part of our bone. The body in response will start um, reproducing cells if it can. You know, unless we're talking about a osteosarcoma or something that would be um, production when it's not needed. Sorry, guys, I'm thinking out loud. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so they're just showing you the endosteum. All right, see, that's in buttress. That's next to the yellow marrow. And the yellow marrow is for your bone, um, your, your bone marrow for your blood um, cell production. There's your compact bone. So if we were. Show you, this is. Give it half of the <clears throat> sagittal cut. 
there's that compact function. We're just giving you kind of a, a transverse cut here, showing you. Right, there's perforating fibers, part of their Sharpie's fibers, just attaching this uh, periosteum to the bone and then interwoven into that are the tendons. There's a nutrient artery. So remember, bones, they said, and lecture are super, super metabolically active, constantly breaking down and building up. They're constantly producing blood cells. Um, uh, yeah, regulating uh, calcium, uh, reabsorption, absorption, uh, breaking down of the matrix, the bone salts, um, calcium, magnesium, things like that. Hemopoietic tissue, hemo, blood, poetic. So they serve bone marrow. Red marrow is found in the trabecular cavities of spongy bone, flat bone. In newborn, newborns, the medullary cavities of all spongy bone contain the red marrow. Right. In adults, uh, red marrow is located in the heads of the femur and humerus, but most active. Okay. So whenever I ask students, you know, if I was going to do a bone marrow transplant, or somebody who had leukemia or needed some kind of bone marrow or, or what area of your bones um, produce the, the most amount of uh, blood cells, all right? That they always tell me heads of the um, femur and the humerus. That's really not true. Most active, most active areas of hemopoiesis are flat bones. So usually regular bones and usually it's gonna be um, vertebral bodies, or the anominates. So they're going to take it out of part of the um, uh, the, the pelvis, per se. All right. Yellow marrow can convert to red if a person becomes anemic. All right. In the last picture, you know, that medullary cavity was yellow. All right. Um, but for all intent and purposes right now, think of it the red marrow is the most um, active. And then you should be remember that because, you know, red blood cells or whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> okay, bone markings, sites of muscle, ligament, tendon attachments to external surfaces. So when we start looking at all of these bones in lecture, any kind of uh, depression, a foramen, a hole, um, uh, phobia, any of these uh, specific markings that we want you to learn is usually going to be um, a nerve innervating blood supply. There's going to be a reason why a, attachment to a major, major muscle. All right. And you're going to get a patient who's going to point to one of these areas. And you, are, you should know instinctively, well, what attaches there? What's in that area? How can I rule in or rule out? Or what would be part of my differential diagnosis? Person's pointing to those specific landmarks that they made us learn in AMP1. All right. Areas involved in joint formation and conduits for blood vessels and nerves. So these holes are going to be where blood supply comes through. And we talk about the uh, the vertebral column. We'll look at the, some of the cervical um, bones or the, the cervical vertebrae, and they're going to have foramen and holes for you know your vertebral arteries, all right? And then. <clears throat> When those get occluded or uh, out of alignment, it can diminish blood supply to the, to the <clears throat> scalp, right? And can be a major source of migraines. So bone markings, there's three types. <clears throat> markings of projection is an outward bulge of a bone. So maybe due to increased stress from muscle pull or as a modification of joints. So usually if you have a pro uh, projection, there's the um, tibial tuberosity. So usually the teller comes over here and it's going to be an attachment site, part of the quadricep. <clears throat> Depression or bowl, a groove-like cut, cut out that can serve as a passageway for vessels, nerves, and plays, rolls, and joints. So um, <clears throat> Here. 
<clears throat> All right, not my best example, but this is a costal rib, obviously. All right, there's depression here. All right, so this could be an intercostal nerve, which innervates your ribs, right? Or um, some of these can be attachment sites for the internal, external, intercostal muscles that help you with uh, breathing. And opening a hole or canal in a bone that serves as a passageway for blood vessels and nerves. Perfect. This is a cervical vertebrae. <clears throat> and in here we have vertebral foramen, foramen means hole. This is where you are. One of your arteries is about through, up through into the skull. <clears throat> All right, so a tuberosity, when they ask you these questions, there's going to be a large rounded projection. So the um, <clears throat> greater tuberosity, uh, a crest, greater trochanter, right? So if someone says, oh, I have a hip pain, or if they actually know where their hip is, because usually they point to the lower back. The greater stroke cancer here is literally where a lot of the bones from your hip attach. So with old, older age, 58, sorry, I'm sure what I said here. <clears throat> with uh, advancing age, as the numbers increase, um, the attachment sites here can become very, very sensitive. Um, if you don't stretch them out, can be so a tubercle is usually a rounded pro projection. Epicondyle, epi means on, raised area on or above a condyle, or spine, sharp, slender, one projection. There's a spine as process. Process any bony prominence. <clears throat> All right, there's the um, head, the sets, usually something's going to articulate with that. There's a condyle, uh, this is above, and the mandible with the TMJ, temporal mandibular um, joint. And when we <clears throat> look at the skull, we're going to be looking at all of these grooves, fissures, um, foramen, like the um, foramen magnum. So your spinal cord is up here. Um, <clears throat> Extremiatus, right? The whole canal line passage, external auditory meatus. Here, see that? Just your ear is looking about here. Sinus is a cavity within bone. We'll see that. We'll talk about the front hole. Maxillary sinuses, these are filled with air, and we hope God, they don't get infected. Fosses are shallow, basin like depressions in a bone. Right. They serve as an articular surface. So, if it's an articular surface, something should be touching that or in contact with it. <clears throat> so, cells of bone tissue, there's five types. Your book is listing osteogenic. Remember, that's going to be um, producing bone. Some type of bone cell could be a marrow cell, could be a bone cell. These are stem cells, so they're going to produce um, whatever the body feels uh, needs to be reproduced. All right, so <clears throat> it may be reproduced for a reason, or maybe reproduced for uh, no reason, or it may be tricked into doing it. If we're talking about some type of uh, osteosarcoma or some kind of uh, yeah osteosarc, osteoblasts. Usually, osteoblasts are younger cells. They're going to usually um, build cells or build bone marrow. For right now, we'll go with that. <clears throat> Osteocytes are adult cells. We have the bone lining cells we saw in the periosteum and endosteum. And osteoclasts, they're going to go in and they're going to break down the bone. All right. <clears throat> what needed if we need calcium uh, in the blood? Or even if we don't need calcium, we're going to break it down and then we're going to rebuild it. Part of the regenerative process, part of wolf flow. 
So here's some osteogenic cells, also known as osteoprogenitor cells, mitotic division, active stem cells in the periosteum and endosteum, as I just said. They're going to be <clears throat> building these bone cells as needed. One stimuli, they differentiate into osteoblasts or bone lining cells. Some remain as osteogenic stem cells. We always need those around in case we need stem cells. Once again, they can differentiate into anything they're needed uh, theoretically. <clears throat> osteoblasts, remember, blasts are younger. Bone forming cells that secrete unmineralized bone mass. A matrix called osteoid. Osteoid is made up of collagen, calcium binding proteins. The collagen is for that strain. We want to bind the um, calcium. We want to calcify the, um, collagen to build that bony matrix. Collagen makes up 90% of bone protein. Osteoblasts are actively mitotic, which means they actively divide. Osteoblasts always just think of building osteoprogenic cell, so this is a stem cell that can differentiate in anything it needs to. Um, and then if it needs to, to, break, to build bone, it'll um, turn into an osteoblast. All right, um, and that produces that matrix, all right? We set the osteoid matrix. Our osteocytes, so these are mature. They no longer divide because they're adults. Right. Uh, maintain the bone matrix and act as stress or strain testers. So, like I said, these kind of supervise the activity of the younger cells. They respond to mechanical stimuli, such as increased force on bone uh, weightlessness. Communicate information to osteoblasts and osteoclast cells that destroy bone. So, bone modeling can occur. So, the osteo Class will break it down. All right, the calcium and the magnesium and the mineral salts, the osteoblasts go in and rebuild them up. And we really want to do that constantly. <clears throat> Bone lining cells, once again, these are going to be endosteum or periosteum. Um, and these are going to lay down bone as needed if homeostasis is occurring. Osteoclasts. Once again, these are going to break down bone, derived from the same hemopoietic stem cells that become macrophages, those big eaters, which go in and look for anything foreign. Giant multinucleated cells function in bone reabsorption, break down the bone. <clears throat> so I'm going to bring this up a few more times during the semester. If it's multinucleated, why would it need more than one nucleus? Okay, <clears throat> so generally they're going to be active somehow. When active, cells are located in depressions called resorption bays. And we'll talk about these sacrificial bonds that are coming up, um, which give bone some of their um, their flexibility. So we, if if we go under a lot of lot of uh, tension or pressure, they'll go. will go. The bone will go in and break some of these bonds, sacrificing it. Um, so the bone doesn't fracture. <clears throat> Cells have ruffled borders that serve to increase surface area for enzyme degradation of the bone. So realize you're, you know, we can't just break down bone. We have to send an enzyme in to start breaking it down. Help seal off area for surrounding matrix. Osteoblasts, remember these are younger bones. Matrix synthesizing cell, they produce an osteoid. So on so forth. There's your osteocyte, it turns into your osteoclast. Go in a little bit of the microscopic anatomy of the bone, and we'll see this more in lecture. So there's compact bone, <clears throat> also called the Meller bone, consists of the osteon, a version system. So if they ask you for the functional unit or um, what is the major um, yeah, functional unit of the bone, it's through the osteon or a version system. We have canals and caniculi, so they're going to generally run um, 90 degrees from each other. Canals run one way, caniculi usually run the other. 
We have interstitial and circumferential or osteon or herbivian system. This is the functional unit of the bone. There, an osteoid is a structural unit of compact bone, consists of elongated cylinders that run parallel to long bone. So they're going to run parallel to this. Acts as tiny weight bearing pillars. An osteon cylinder consists of several rings, a bone called the lamellae. And I always just remember the two L's as the ring like, the one rings around it. <clears throat> lamellae contain collagen fibers that gives it the strength. Remember, bone is usually 90% collagen. Withstand stress and resisting twisting. Bone salts are found between collagen fibers. So, there's the collagen fibers that run in different directions. And remember, I said that the structure or unit of that um, <clears throat> and the discs and your bones. All right, they're, I don't remember, it's 45 or something. <clears throat> There's some angle that I said that I think it was Dunlop. Let me depot it. I don't know. <clears throat> One of the tire companies actually made the bias of tires that same bonding, that same angle. All right, so <clears throat> the center. Central herbergian canal runs to the core of the osteon. And we'll see that as a, a, a blank space on the uh, histology slides. Contains the blood vessels and nerve fibers, and then perforating or right, poking through Volkmann's canals line the endosteum, remember the inner lining, that occur at right angles to the central canal. All right, so they're going to be running at, at right angles to that. Connect blood vessels and nerves in the periosteum, the medullary cavity, and the central canal. Remember, if there's a medullary cavity, there's usually some kind of a cortex. The lacunae are small cavities that contain osteocytes. So lacunae, if it's a chondrocyte or an osteocyte, it's going to be just an area that the, the adult cells generally just um, live in. Right. Caniculi. So this sounds like small canal, right? Here like canals that connect lacunae to each other in the central canal. So these can intercommunicate. And these osteocytes can move back and forth. Right. Osteoblasts is a Greek bone matrix, the osteoid. Matrix contain, maintain contact with each other and osteocytes via cell productions with gap junctions. Right, we're going to see gap junctions when we talk about um, <clears throat> intercoated discs and the myocardium. And there's a way that these cells can communicate with each other and they know when to regulate, they self regulate their um, contraction or your heartbeat if everything's working properly. When the matrix hardens and cells are trapped, um, when matrix Sorry, when it hardens, cells are trapped, um, the caniculi form, those little tiny um, spaces. And once again, this allows communication between the osteocytes of the osteon permitting nutrients and waste to be relayed from one cell to the other. So these kind of ossify, they leave spaces so we have small, tiny passageways for communication and um, material to work. <clears throat> Interstitial and circumferential limits. So interstitial, remember, it's going to be usually interstitial means in between cells. Circumferential, just start thinking about around the periphery. And generally, it's going to be something cylindrical or round. Interstitial lamellae, lamellae that are not part of the osteon itself. So the osteon is going to be that central structure. These are going to be um, uh, around it, okay? Some fill gaps between forming osteons, others are remnants of osteons cut by bone remodeling. So this could be part of an osteon, a former osteon that was broken down and rebuilt. All right. So just realize when you look at a slide or a picture, that was a snapshot in time. But if you took the same exact picture later, just in the living tissue, it would look nothing like that. All right. Circumferential. The my just deep to the periosteum is that outer layer, <clears throat> but superficial to the endosteum. So this is between the periosteum and the endosteum. These layers of lamellae extend around the entire surface of the diaphysis. This help long bone to resist twisting motion.
central canal, there's your osteon, which is a functional unit, there's your circumferential lamellae, and these kind of resist um, that torque, and these are gonna have sacrificial bonds in them. So if there's twisting and turning or impact, it'll give up these bonds, um, kind of like a shear pin, that's what that is for the snowblower or like a prop on a boat, kind of gives, so you don't uh, completely twist the gear mechanism or whatever it happens to be. All right, so there's your artery, there's the caniculi, these are small canals, right? There's the lacunae where they kind of live and hang out. There's an osteocyte just chilling out in there. And just realize <clears throat> that these, um, even the best slides I can show you, because it depends on how they slice it, these have areas where they can all connect. So they can move nutrients back and forth because here's your blood supply. Nerve supply, nutrients, and waste. They have to have a way of moving that out. All right, so spongy bone. All right, it's gonna be that trabeculae. It looks just like a, a sponge. If you were to cut a, a sponge or a sponge candy, it appears poorly organized, but it's organized along lines of stress to help bones resist any stress. And once again, this is how they, they actually took this design. That's how they made buttresses. Um, and even if you look at some of the, um, the finials on some of these old Victorians, they're, um, they took some of the designs off of that. So they're, they weigh the least, the least, the least amount of material, and they're actually designed to distribute uh, weight and force. Typically, I like cables on a suspension burn confer strength of the bone. No osteons are present, so there's no functional units, but typically do contain irregularly arranged lamellae and osteocytes as adult cells interconnect by caniculi. All right. Capillaries in the endosteum supply nutrients. More information than we need to know, but. Okay, so there's the spongy bone. And just realize there's no real osteons you can see there, but there's that trabeculae. So these are dis distributing that force. All right, <clears throat> bone is made up of both organic and inorganic compounds. The organic compounds osteogenic cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, the linings, osteoid, remember this is what those osteoblasts secrete. That's the um, material that, that turns into bone. It consists of ground substances and collagen fibers, which is 90% of bone, which contribute to the high tensile strength and flexibility of the bone. Okay. So they'll ask you a question, um, you know, like what secretes the osteoid or what make, what is the substance that osteoblasts secrete? They'll ask you something like that. <clears throat> organic compounds, all right. all right? So these are all those organic compounds, those cells, literal cells there. Oh, uh, here it is. Resistance of bone is due to sacrificial bonds in or between the collagen molecules. They stretch and break. They dissipate energy and prevent fractures. So they take the the impact of the blow or the twisting of something, and they'll just, they'll, they'll snap these bonds to dissipate the force. And if there's no additional trauma, the bonds reform. You know, and this happens really if we're young teenagers or young children, these um, reform quickly. As you um, get older, um, these, the uh, regenerative stage usually slows down. So the breakdown stage usually happens. The restorative uh, stage takes a little bit longer, sometimes a lot longer. Inorganic compounds. Now I've seen this question a lot. Hydroxyapatites, apatites, however you want to pronounce it, I really need to remember it. Makes up 60% of bone, hydroxyapatite, right? Consists mainly of phosphate crystals in and around collagen fibers. All right, this is the resistance, uh, the responsible for the hardness and resistance to compression. So the osteoid making up the bone, and then we have the inner, that's the organic compound. The inorganic compound is the hydroxyapatite. All right, that would be a nasty question if they asked you what was the um, <clears throat> organic, uh, what's created by the organic compound, or organic portion, what's created by the inorganic portion, but just remember it's osteoid, 
is created by the osteoblast and the hydroxyapatite mineral salts um, are uh, secreted the calcium phosphate crystals and the collagen fibers. So these are mineral salts. So if something is um, calcified or um, hardened, usually it's going to contain part of the hydroxyapatite because it's going to have, if you look, it has calcium phosphate crystals. All right. They're going to harden things off. Bone is half as strong as steel in resisting compression and as strong as steel in resisting tension. <clears throat> all right, so it's pretty good at, very good at resisting compression, all right, but um, it's super strong in resisting tension. <clears throat> um, lasts long after death because of mineralized composition. And, you know, I just showed you guys this. Um, was here when I was a student, that was 1991, maybe. Um, and it was probably here before that. So this is probably, uh, the campus was here in 74. So I'm gonna say it's probably maybe 45 years old. And this can reveal information about ancient people. They can go in and they can um, they can take parts of it out and they can see what's in there. All right. So I think that's it. Stop. <clears throat>